All right, so we are continuing our series in 1 Corinthians, and because I went long this morning, I will go shorter this evening. Yes, I thought about that because I looked and it was about 20 minutes long, <laughs> so I thought, this is only fair. <laughs> if you will take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, and we're going to look at, hopefully tonight, verses 1 through 24 as we just continue verse by verse through 1 Corinthians. I, I just want to remind you of how important it is. Uh, this is going to be verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. I want to remind you how important it is to know and understand the audience of this book. We are talking to believers. Now, this is important to understand because there are many teachers out there that don't properly describe what a believer is. And if we look at a believer as being a conditional thing that you can cycle in and out of being a believer, then we won't understand 1 Corinthians. The Bible teaches that an individual can have assurance of their salvation. That's not a man-made principle. That's something that God's Word has delivered. Whosoever believeth receives something, uh, particularly everlasting life. We talked in uh, John 1, uh, 12 today about, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. And we looked further in the next verse where it talked about how this is not a birth that is of flesh and blood or of the will of man or anything like that. It's a new birth, a spiritual birth, that is a permanent thing. So in order for us to properly understand what Paul is talking about here tonight in 1 Corinthians, we have to understand what it means to be a believer. Now, we've heard this all of our lives, but it's important to be reminded of this, especially as we get into a topic specifically about marriage and how believers should act within their marriages. The last two chapters that we've covered, chapter 5 and chapter 6, have started this discussion about what's happening outside of marriage. What the Corinthian church is saying, we're going to do these things, uh, whether they are wrong or not. We have liberty in Christ, so we're just going to sin, 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 and, and that's it. It's important to understand that they were in a believing state. They remain in that state. Um, even though their actions might say otherwise, they're acting lost like the world, they are believers. So a person can know for sure that they're a believer if they answer the following question correctly. If you were to stand before God and He were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? It's a very important answer because the answer reveals this. It reveals what you are trusting in. If you're trusting in your good works, then your answer would be, I would say to God, I have done this and I have not done that. If your answer is, I believe that I, I can appeal to mercy, I can, I can specifically say, God, show mercy on me, have forgiveness um, upon me. All of those answers are incorrect in light of Scripture, not in light of my opinion, but in light of what clear Scripture says. If we were to just illustrate it, it would look something like this. If I were to let this little item here represent sin, because my wallet is not on me, <laughs> I'm going to put this on top of my hand because we've all sinned. God, He loves us, but He hates our sin. The requirement to get to heaven is perfection. No sin. Not even the presence of sin at any point. It's not you stopped sinning. You never started, and we're unable to do that. God loves us even in that state. But God is also perfect, and He requires perfection to get into heaven. If we were to pay for one sin, we'd have to spend an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. That's the reality that the Scripture teaches. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. Now, good works can't save us. If my notes tonight represented good works, I can't take my notes and wrap my good works in them and then offer them to God as a payment. He won't accept that because the wages for sin is what? Not good works, it's death. So, we have a problem. What Paul is teaching these Corinthian believers, or what he is reminding them of, is built off of this message. Here, this hand will represent Jesus Christ. He was perfect. He had no sin. 
And in John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that's you and me, that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus Christ, that, and this is the important part, whosoever, specifically, when Paul was teaching this message to the Corinthian believers, the Corinthian believers were the whosoever. You here tonight are the whosoever. Whosoever believeth in him. And that sin was laid on Jesus. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have a certain kind of life, everlasting life. So, if you were to stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? If you had a correct understanding of what Jesus Christ has done for you, then your answer would sound something like, I have believed on the payment your son made. I believe he took my place and paid for my sin. Now, let me in. Now, I wouldn't say that. But he would have to let you in because he would honor not your payment, he would honor his son's payment, which has been applied to you. So the greatest news in all the world is that a person can know that their sin is paid. People live their entire, their, their entire lives not knowing this message. It's a, it's, it's a sad thing. It's a very sad thing. It's a very real thing. And so if you're here tonight and you have no assurance of your salvation, you can know that. And if you're here tonight and you already know that, you need to be reminded of it as we study this particular passage. Can a person know for sure that they're going to heaven before they die? Yes. How can they know that? By believing on Jesus Christ and on Him alone. Not Jesus Christ and my good works just in case. Not some man's statement about the Word of God. But what the Bible says, whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. And the verses go on to say he, is not, uh, he that believeth is not condemned. So there's a chance that a believer can have assurance. No, not a chance. There's a guarantee. It is there. And so we have to understand that, especially when we get into these passages. So we're going to break these uh, 24 verses up into three different sections. And I want you to make sure you're following along because a lot of these verses are hotly contested. And a lot of what I'm teaching you tonight is how I believe it's interpreted. And you may listen to somebody else who's clear on the gospel like me, and they differ from opinion. That's going to happen from time to time. Let me just say this. Nothing can replace your own study of the Word of God. And I encourage you to do that. Unfortunately, a lot of people are just coming to churches around the country and they're just mouth open, not checking what they're being fed. Well, he has an internet ministry. Well, he's on TV. Well, he's, he's really nicely dressed and he speaks nicely. That doesn't mean they speak the truth. A person's truth is verified by what the Scripture says about what they're saying. We let the Scripture inform our opinions, not our, opinion, uh, uh, our opinions to inform what the Scripture says. But tonight, in this specific passage that we get to, these are new things for some of us. Some of these things we have not heard before, or some of them we just haven't studied. And I encourage you, after our meeting tonight, go home and study them. Go home and study them. But we're going to be talking tonight about God's principles for marriage. In chapter 5 and in chapter 6, we saw how much damage fornication brings. And we talked about it a lot. And the Corinthian church, obviously in verse 1, had written something to Paul about marriage. And we don't know what it is, um, but we also know that there was a problem of fornication. So Paul got these things from the Corinthian church. He didn't like what they were saying because they weren't rooted in truth. And he also found out about their, their flippant behavior of sexual activity. It was just out of control. People uh, sleeping with whoever they wanted to sleep with. People getting divorced for the mere fact of, we don't like each other anymore. I mean, that's happening all around the country today. And Paul addresses all these things through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's good for us to look at it and see what he says. So let's look at those first six verses. We'll read those and then we'll go line upon line. Paul says in chapter 7, verse 1, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, that doesn't mean even in marriage. What that means is, outside of marriage, to avoid this problem that you're getting yourself into with fornication, you ought just be separate from one another. They, you, 
you don't even want to have the appearance of evil. That's a good practice. Because like we talked about last week, every line that you stop at, the next time you get started, that's going to be the line you cross. And then before you know it, you're caught in that act of fornication. And it's tough. It is, it, it is very difficult. There's a certain persuasion to it that Paul had described uh, in, in chapter 6 that we covered last week. Verse 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, to avoid these things, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now the Bible's very clear here about how marriage works. It's a unity before God. It's a covenant established with those two individuals before God between a man and a woman. And it's very important to recognize that anything the world says outside of that is contrary to God's teaching. That's it. Point blank, period. Homosexual marriage is not honored in the Bible. And unfortunately, there are ministries that want to appeal to people of that ilk, and they want to make them feel good about what they're doing, which is wrong. Now listen, I want to be very clear. Love the sinner. We are supposed to reach people. I'm not asking people to turn from their sin before they can get saved. That's hypocritical. The Bible doesn't teach that. But I'm also not going to look a person in the face and say that God honors a marriage that he says very clearly here is between one man and one woman. Look what it says in verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Now this is a specific thing. This is the act of sex within a marriage. It ought to be honored. And it is not to be something that is taken away out of anger or withheld. And you're going to see why. Look what it says in verse 4. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, uh, but, the, but the wife. We'll get back to that verse in a second. But continue on in verses 5 and 6. Defraud ye not one another. Do not withhold what a marriage should be producing. There should be healthy sexual activity within a marriage. It is honorable. It is not something to be withheld. Because, look at the rest of this verse, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. Now this doesn't mean that everything he just said is nullified. I believe he's addressing what they were asking, a specific issue, and he lays out a very good roadmap that all marriages should honor. Let me say this too. Marriage is a very serious thing. A very serious thing. It is a picture of the church. We should not be getting married for the sake of getting married. I think it's great when two people want to get married. I think it's equally great for them to seek good counsel for a long period of time. When Kyla and I wanted to get married, we set a date a year out, specifically designed, outside of making sure people could come, but specifically designed that we sought wise counsel on whether we should be married or not. Many people have made hard decisions because of a lack of good marital counseling, premarital counseling. Because young people should know, if you're going to get into a marriage, these are the expectations of a marriage. And uh, the, another note I'd like to add to this. If we look at what Paul spoke to in, in 1 Corinthians 5 and in 1 Corinthians 6, there was a lot of sex outside of marriage happening. That damages the sex inside of the marriage in the future. Think about it. When you look at a young person who goes to university or whatever it may be, and they have sex with a bunch of different people, they're going to hurt their future spouse. Because the sex that they have in that marriage could be compared to the sex that they have with somebody else. And who's to say that at some point you no longer want to be in that marriage because, well, you're desiring what someone else could have. You see how it can be dangerous? Now, the world is against this idea. The world says what I'm saying is restrictive, it's difficult, it's uh, archaic. No, I think it's good. You talk to 
men and women that are in marriages where they um, had sex with their wife or their husband only, they would prefer it that way. I wouldn't want to be with somebody that could be thinking about somebody else while they're doing that with me. That would be shameful. But we set ourselves up for those issues. And then young people get into a marriage and they have no idea what to expect in the marriage. Well, we just love each other. Well, this is how you love each other. You're supposed to not defraud one another. Be consistent in demonstrating your love for your spouse. And it's not just with sex. It can be with anything. Sacrificing time. There's a great book out there that talks about the different love languages. It's good to know your spouse's love language. Does your spouse enjoy service time? Receiving nice things? Not material things, but nice acts of service? Something that maybe they would do around the house, you do that and they interpret love that way? That's a wise thing to know. Do they enjoy words of affirmation? Speaking to them and saying, you are doing a good job and I'm thankful for you. Some people rely on that. And I'm not saying that's a prideful thing. But you need to know your spouse. And I think what was happening in this church is, not this church, but the Corinthian church, I want to make sure we're, we're clear on that, is things were just flippant all the time. Problem after problem after problem to the point where a young man is sleeping with his stepmother and it's being praised. What? If we set these things from the start, it's going to help down the road. I love working with teenagers. And I know when I see two people and they, you know, she's always making sure she's in front of him and he always makes sure that she sees him make the big sports play, you know. Or maybe the two kids are now boyfriend and girlfriend. I will, I will talk to them. I'll say, listen, I want you guys to understand. If you love each other, you're going to keep your hands off each other. But guess what? Unfortunately, that's, that's not done. Because the world says, hey, all this stuff is good. All this stuff is fine. You, I mean, you got to have experience. I remember a guidance counselor in high school alluding to how in my college years I will learn what I like in a woman. That's wicked. But that's how kids are being taught. It's what's in the music. It's what's in the shows. So we have to make sure that we're clear on what the Bible says is right. We still love people. We still want them to make the right decision, but I'm not going to advise that to a teenager, 16 years old, 15 years old, using their body in that way. That ought not be. But that's the way it is. And we have to learn how to work in those things. So when we look at this chapter here, you'll learn about how a marriage should operate. Now look back in verse 4. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and then vice versa. What this means is, it's a paradox. When that young lady gets married to that young man, they become one. She has willingly, she should understand, given herself over to her husband. And it's the same thing for the husband. Don't get it twisted. It's the same thing for the husband. They're now a team. They now work together. I don't like the phrase, it's 50-50. It's not. It's 100% you, 100% her, working for the Lord. That's how it ought to be. That's not how it is all the time. Because if it's 50-50, well, what's the other 50% for? You? To do what? For what reason? Well, we all got to have our, our freedom. You know, I got to be able to, she's got her friends and I got my friends. I, you know, I think that's okay. But you know how a lot of affairs start? that way, that mindset. Well, I'm just going to go down to the bar and watch the game with my friends. Now you start seeing somebody looking at you and you're thinking, oh, you know, that makes me feel good because you normally only have your wife looking at you. And then pride begins to happen. Look, it's within each and every one of us, all of us in here, to commit that kind of sin. And that's why it's spoken so strongly of here because we see it in this Corinthian church. They were experiencing it. It was a part of their culture. They were celebrating this kind of behavior. And it ought not be that way. So we have to set up these rumble strips, these warnings, so that when we see something happening that's not good, we can address it. 
Look what it says now in verse, we're going to look at verses 7 through 16. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his power, or excuse me, hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Now, some commentators believe here that Paul was a widower because of what he says in this next verse. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Paul, we, are, we see here, it's important to recognize, he's saying if you can stay celibate, it would be a good thing. He's not saying this is how it should be. Because guess what? If everybody really took that, it, that verse that way, the church would be extinct. There are some individuals who are able to stay celibate. It's something that is given to them and, and they can handle that. Paul is saying here, for his circumstances, he wishes that all people were like that in light of these circumstances because everyone else was touching everybody else in this church. You understand why he's saying that? They were having a problem with keeping their bodies to themselves or to their spouses. Their problem was they couldn't stop sleeping with other people. And it was a part of their culture and highly celebrated, especially in that Greek culture. I mean, have you ever looked at Greek sculptures? Not a lot of them have clothes on. Okay? It was celebrated. The body was celebrated. The body's still celebrated today. We're getting closer and closer. It is. You don't have to do a lot of work in order for someone to see something they shouldn't see. And here's the problem. Paul is saying, as he said in verse 1, to avoid this fornication, don't touch someone that's not your wife, someone that's not your husband. And then he says here in verse 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. If you can do it, that's great. He's not judging you if you can't. But if you're using it as an excuse to sleep with someone who you're not married to, that's wrong. I and mean, the Bible just teaches that. That's what it is. Look in verse 9. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Well, what does that mean? This does not mean that if you're committing fornication, it's a sin that's going to send you to hell. The, I have heard Baptist preachers use that, and it's wrong. Because then they like to put a little rhyme in there. Baptist preachers, they like to put that in there, right? And it's like, turn or burn. Ooh, sounds good. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. What is being said here is, it's better for you to get married if you burn in the desire to satisfy what should be satisfied and married. Then go get married. Choose wisely. Do the right thing. And as he says later on, which we won't cover until next week, unequally yoked. You see how this becomes so important? We can't just make decisions that could affect our future in a negative way and the person that we get involved with. But he's saying if you can't keep it, it's better to marry than to try to fight that passion. Because remember, a lot of these people were probably just sleeping around anyway. That, that's what they were doing. So he said, uh, it's better for you to get married than to burn in that way. Look in verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. And, excuse me, but and if she depart, let her remain, and you should mark this, unmarried. If you're going to get divorced for a reason that's not biblical, you need to understand you are to remain unmarried. That's what the Bible teaches. Look what it says here. Or be reconciled to her husband. Not to another person, but to be reconciled to that individual. Now you've got to also understand the light of this passage. The Jewish people and people of the world were getting divorced for the worst reasons. I mean, men would come before the council and say, in Deuteronomy 24, it says that if my wife no longer is pleasing in my eyes, then she is wrong. And I have seen a woman who pleases me more. Therefore, we will get divorced. And that was checked off. Can you imagine? 
well, I, I really just don't like him anymore. I mean, we've kind of grown apart, so we can get divorced. And the council was saying, okay, yeah, we'll approve that. I mean, people are getting divorced for far less today, aren't they? People go into marriages ready to talk about if it's going to (laughs) end. What? That's why premarital counseling is, it's important. But he says here in verse 11, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So everything that was just said about the situation where the wife left there, it's the same for the husband. If if you're going to put her away for things that are outside of your biblical authority, you better remain unmarried. Are people doing that today? No. And you know who it hurts the most? The kids that are in the marriage. It hurts them tremendously. It cannot, you know, it's something that can be overcome, but we ought to avoid it, right? Look what it says in verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if uh, he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. This is interesting. If you're in a marriage, maybe you guys didn't check what your beliefs were, and you were either saved going into that marriage or got saved in the marriage, for the sake of trying to reach that person, stay with them. This was contrary to what they were doing in in Corinth. Contrary to what they were doing to get divorced. The littlest of things were splitting a marriage. Now, I can imagine it would be very hard. I have known people that were in marriages where one believed the gospel and one did not. It's a very difficult thing to do. But stay in it. Paul says that here. Look in verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. You stay in that marriage, it doesn't give them sanctification to eternal life. That's not what this is teaching here. What I believe is teaching here is you can bring honor to that unbelieving spouse. You can try and win them. Same thing for those children. You see where all of this is rooted? Your perspective. Is it all about you or is it, as Christ did, submitting Himself, humbling Himself, being a servant? Look in verse 15. But if that unbelieving, which we have been talking about here, if that unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Now, what I think is meant here, and again, this, this, uh, this is my opinion. You may hear someone say something different. I think if you have someone who's a believer and they're in a marriage, and again, what's a believer? Someone that has received Jesus Christ, not into their heart, not into their life, but they have put their trust in Him for the payment of their sin. That believing spouse, if they're in a marriage with an unbeliever and the unbeliever wants to leave, let them leave. I don't think, when it says bondage there, I I don't think that means that they're now free to get remarried. I think that the bondage of turmoil that's obviously coming from that marriage, the believer does not need to subject the unbeliever to that. If they want to go, let them go. And look at the last part of this verse in verse 15. But God hath called us to peace. You may win that person. Look at what it says in verse 16. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? You could do it. Paul's saying, we don't don't know. By separating automatically, you lose that opportunity. And by fighting a person who wants to go, you may lose the opportunity there too. This is what I call wisdom. Because the world is so opposite of this. You've probably seen it in your own life or in the life of your friends or family. Hastiness to just end it, get it over with. Or someone who just doesn't want to let somebody go so they make it hard and difficult. Look what it says in verse uh, 17. And now we're we're going to finish the rest of this chapter here. 
uh, with the, these last portions. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all the churches. I think Paul is wrapping up his statement here by saying this. You know your situation. So use the judgment that is given here to handle that situation. That's what I'm going to say to all the churches that I go to. His message is not going to change. So what's the synopsis here? If you are going to get married, understand what is required in the marriage and be willing to do it. If you're going to leave for a reason that's not biblical, then guess what? Be prepared to stay in that unmarried state until you are reconciled with your spouse. If you are in a marriage and you're unequally yoked, meaning you are with somebody who has not believed on Jesus Christ, stay. If you can stay, stay. If you can't, let them go. And, and this is the very difficult thing for people to learn because it requires you to just take your eyes off yourself for one second. It's so hard for the world to do this because the world is internal. It wants to focus on itself. Yeah, well, you know, you're your own individual. You got to do what makes you happy. When you're in a marriage, you need to lower yourself. You need to be willing to serve for your spouse. They come first. Of course, the Lord is first. But you love the Lord by loving them. I've seen many marriages destroyed by selfishness, wicked selfishness. When we got married, Kyle and I were advised there should be no bank account that is unknown. You know why? It stops the opportunity of you doing something you shouldn't be doing. Like debt. Like buying things and keeping them. It shouldn't be anything hidden in a marriage. It should be open. But the, the worldly counseling is have separate accounts. Because if she leaves you, she can't get it. I got news for you, that ain't true. <laughs> they have lawyers for that. But the attitude is going into the marriage waiting for it to fall. Protecting it in case it doesn't happen. Like this is a trial run. I was told when I got married to Kyla that I better make sure that I'm going to be faithful to her. I was about to like throw up of stress just thinking of the idea of proposing to her. Because I knew that I am demonstrating to her that I am willing, at a point in the future, to give away the rest of my life, my time, to you. That's a big decision. Isn't it a nice thing to compare to what Christ did on the cross? That He gave up the life that He had here? That He willingly died for people who would never even believe Him? That's how I ought love my wife. And that's how she ought love me. And the same for you. And the same here, Corinthian believers. Look what it says in verse 18. Is there any man called uncircumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. What Paul is saying here, look in verse 19, circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. And the keeping of commandments of God can never establish your perfection. So Paul is using the illustration of whatever condition you're in, that's the condition you're in. It doesn't matter about your condition. It matters about your position. Now that's pretty Baptist right there. It rhymed and it's biblical. Okay, My position is in Christ. I'm an American. I live in this country. I'm of a certain descent. I shouldn't have to change that. I, because now I follow the Jewish Bible, I shouldn't now become a Jew. You understand what I'm saying? And, and, and Paul is saying here, as he says in verse 20, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he is called. And the reason why he says that is because he's setting it up to understand you have a new calling now as a child of God. What you are defined here by the world doesn't matter. You're not judged by that anymore. You're judged by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which when you believed was applied to your sin. Now when God looks at you, He doesn't see a married or unmarried or a divorced or a, a, you know, 
a person in a marriage or a Jew or a Gentile or bond or free. He sees the righteousness of his son. That's the goodness of what God has to offer every single person in this entire world. In this room, that offer is open. You see how he's setting it up? See, because the Corinthians were worried about the, the now, the current. Well, I have this desire to sexually gratify. Well, I need to go out and get that. It ought not be that way. You think about your position, where you are. You're seated in the heavenlies. Hello. We just talked about it in, in, in 1 Corinthians 6. Do we take the body of Christ and join it with the harlot? God forbid. Well, if we wouldn't do that, why are we living like we are? <laughs> Verse 21. Art thou called being a servant? And specifically, there, that translation is, are you in the role of a slave? Whether you're in indentured servitude properly or not. What does he say about that? Care not for it. That's strong. Are you in a position that you're, or a, a condition in life that you're not satisfied with? Let that pale in comparison to what you have already received in Jesus Christ. That's good stuff, ain't it? And all that will help you in your marriage. I think a lot of marriages could be saved if there was more humility in the marriage. Look what it says in uh, verse 22. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. So if you got saved while you, and Paul is speaking here, if you got saved as an indentured servant, as a slave, in the eyes of God, you're a free man. Live in that truth and then try to win people from your current condition. Listen, I know this is going to sound out of this world. Teenagers can only reach teenagers. It's the truth. A teenager can reach another teenager because they're the same kind of person. They understand the same thing. I see it. I run the youth ministry. This is why it's important that we're willing to share the gospel wherever we are. Because you're in a place that I can't be. You can only reach people that you can reach, and I can only reach people that I can reach. And what he's saying here is if you're called in as a slave... If you trust in Jesus Christ and you're in a slave position, guess what? The Lord sees you as a free man. Care not for your current condition. Dwell on the position that you're in and reach the people you're around. That's different than what the world says. We want to see the hero's journey. We want to see our hero who was mistreated get revenge. We applaud that. We look for that. Our stories are all like that. Christ is different in that He had all that power. He could have, as, as the song says and as the Scripture says, He could have called 10,000 angels to defend when He was on the cross, but He didn't. He humiliated Himself further and was obedient unto death. And then the Scripture continues to say, even the death of the cross, which was to the Jews a shame to hang on the tree. It was a shame, but He willingly did it for the joy that was set before Him. That's a kind of person that I want to get to know. I have seen marriages you know, fall apart. I've seen people offer forgiveness, the things that were done to them, that if I were just being absolutely honest, it would be hard to react that way. But it all makes sense when we look at it in light of the Gospel. What could a person do to us that we could never forgive if Christ has forgiven us of everything? And that's called perspective. And we ought to live in that perspective often. Finish up here in verses 23 and 24. You are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called, therein, what does it say? And we're talking about believers here. Not abide to a lost man. You can't. You're incompatible with God. You have a sin payment that needs to be made. But since you're a believer... Just be faithful. And I tighten my mouth a little bit with that because that is the hardest thing for people to do. I have read books of people that write questions in and they always have a set of circumstances that nullifies them from obeying truth like this. Yes, that would apply, but you don't know my condition. I don't have to know your condition. This applies to every believer. As it says there, Brethren, verse 24, let 
every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. Think about it as different places of employment. Right? You work at employer A. If you're called there, if you get saved, that doesn't mean you radically have to find a new employer. As a matter of fact, you should start trying to win people where you are. And if it changes over time, then it changes over time. Look in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 in verse 5. This is on page 1304. Hebrews chapter 13 in verse 5. When I study the Scripture and I hear a principle that's taught, it reminds me of where it's taught in other places. And the phrase that comes to mind when I read 1 Corinthians 7.24 is content. Be content. And I know that's in another place of Scripture. Look what it says in Hebrews 13.5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be what? Content. Do you know why? Men run out on their marriages because they're not content. They covet something that is not theirs. Y'all, the Scripture lines up. It's not a question of whether it does or doesn't. It's a question of whether you will do what it says or you won't. That's what the question is. Life is hard. It is not fair. And anyone who told you it would be was lying to you. There are people in Texas right now that are going through horrible things. Roofs caving in. Pipes freezing in one area. And as that ice expands, they're bursting. The home is being flooded. People, are, they don't know what to do, so they'll go into their garage trying to get warm, and they'll turn their cars on trying to heat the garage, and they die. People are opening up their ovens to warm their homes and not, re- not realizing in their panic they've got propane and they're flooding their house with gas. Life is not fair. And God controls the climate, so there's that. But we can't go out here and, and, and think that it, we're going to be treated fairly by the world. The way you respond to the unfairness of the world is how people see the love of God. We talked about that last week. No man has seen God at any time. We love one another. As I was driving home today, I almost, got, I almost rear-ended this guy because his brake lights don't work. He didn't put his indicator on. And my truck is, I know it's a 2010, it's got 100,000 miles on it, but it's new to me. I haven't even had it for a month. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate that truck. I'm very thankful for it. And I got mad because I had to hit the brakes and I came this close with hitting that guy's bumper and everything inside of me wanted to do what I might have done, I might have even done it in that moment. Whip that car around, go buy him, some type of gesticulation, you know what I'm saying? Like, why you pay attention? You know what I'm saying? But you know what? You know what? I realized in that moment, I don't have anything to prove to this guy. And what am I going to do? Am I going to encourage him by whipping my car around? And what if I did that? I didn't pay attention. Who's in the lane next to me, and I hit somebody? And what if I do that, and that man decides to come to church two weeks later, and he remembers I'm the guy in that white truck that did that to him? It's, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That'd be a new visitor welcome card that I don't know if I'd want to read. <laughs> Perspective. Allow those things to happen to you. Give me a time where you stand up for yourself, that's fine. But don't go starting things, especially in your marriage. Dr. Arnold talked about it. You remember where he was saying you, you, you take circumstances and you harvest them like hand grenades? And you've got this war chest of things that have been done wrong to you. And you're just waiting for the day when you're done and you pull all the grenades out and you pull all the pins out. And sadly, you destroy a marriage in a matter of minutes. I really encourage you to pour over this passage tonight. And just 
See what you pull out of it. I spent a lot of time trying to make sure that I was clear in what I thought the interpretations of those passages are. I do believe that there are biblical grounds for divorce. I think the Scripture talks about that. There are very clear things. But most of the time, people get divorced for things that are not biblical. I think the Scripture just proved that because Paul had to talk to him about how to behave. And I don't think where Paul said, I speak and not the Lord, I don't think that means that that portion of Scripture is no longer inspired. Because then we can start doing that in different places too. And, and that, that, that's a bad road to follow. I think what is said in here is what God approves. Period. And it's good stuff. Is it going to be challenging to follow it? Yeah. Doesn't mean it's not worth it. <laughs> Look up here. This hand represents you and me. This little breath thing represents sin. I'm going to put it on top of my hand because we've all sinned. The payment for sin is death. Eternal separation from God forever in a place called hell. God loves us. He hates this sin because the sin separates us from Him. In order to get to heaven, we have to be perfect, just like God, and we're not. We all have sin. The Bible says that we're saved by grace. It's a gift of God, not of works. We cannot work our way to heaven. That's a real sad thing. There's going to be people that are going to stand before God and say, I did this and I didn't do that, and He will say to them, depart from, you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. We ought to get this right. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He was fully God and fully man. And because God loved us so much, He allowed His Son to take all of our sin on Himself. He paid for it. That's why He cried out, it is finished. He didn't say, I did my part, hope you can do it, and then died. He said, it is finished. What did He mean by that? The payment for all the sin of all the world was paid for in that one moment. He was buried, and He rose again three days later to prove that that payment was done, and He offers to all who simply believe. That's what's different about this church. You ask other pastors out there, what do I have to do to know I'm going to heaven? And they probably can't give you a clear answer. Or they'll say a phrase like, you got to ask them in your life. What do you mean by that? They don't know. They're just repeating what they've been told. The Bible says, these things have been written unto you, look up here, that believeth on the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that you can know it. You can know that you have eternal life. And that's, that's the way it's written. And so that's what we ought to say. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heads are bowed, please. Eyes are closed. Nobody looking around. If you're here and you don't have assurance of salvation, if you don't know where you're going to go when you die, I want to encourage you to believe on Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says that He was fully God. He was fully man. And that means a lot, but what you need to understand about that is he was perfect without sin. He was born into this world perfect. And when he died on the cross, he was perfect. And when he rose again from the dead, he was perfect. And when he ascended into heaven, perfect. And he lives now in perfection. And he died for you. So if you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't let that terminology scare you. It just simply means receive that free gift that He offered to you. Now I ask for heads bowed and eyes closed for privacy. I always try to give this invitation because it's very important. Is there anyone here today that would like to believe on Jesus? You don't have to come down here, nothing. You can do it right where you're sitting. Simply receive what He did for you. And what is that? He died for your sin. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Is there anyone by an uplifted hand and say, Pastor Jesse, I don't understand much, but that makes sense. And I'm going to believe on Jesus Christ tonight. You don't have to continue to do it. And raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that what I said made sense. So is there anyone at all by an uplifted hand would indicate they believed on Jesus tonight? Heads are bowed and eyes are still closed. A lot of good principles for how to run a marriage. If you know people that are struggling in a marriage or you yourself are struggling in a marriage, come see me. I'm not a licensed counselor. I don't claim to be. I'm just a teacher of the Word of God, which is really better than any licensed counselor. Pray for one another. Be kind to your spouse. Love them as Christ loves you. 
Father, thank you so much for your word and thank you for all that we can learn from it. I pray, Lord, that everyone here has received you. I'm thankful for that gospel message that applies to literally everyone. There is no one excluded. Give us a good week. Bring us back here safely on Wednesday night for prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's episode of Bible Line, make sure to subscribe to the channel and share this video with a friend. Do you have a Bible question? Send us an email, questions at BibleLineMinistries.org, and we'll do our best to get you an answer. Or you can leave your question in the comments of this video. Be sure to check the links in the description for more clear Bible teaching. Bible Line is a ministry of Calvary Community Church located in Tampa, Florida.